Hi, I'm Dr. Cass Spencer Smith of Private Practice Ninja, and today we're going to be talking about how much it costs to get set up in private practice. How much does it cost you to run your private practice? Gone are the days when hospitals not used to be able to give you nice little incentives, otherwise known as freebies, with things like room costs and secretarial hire. And a few years ago, the Competition and Markets Authority took all that away, and some consultants had a bit of a strop about it. Working in private practice costs money. When you work in the NHS, you turn up, you get a nice little wage packet and it costs you bugger all. So what are the two costs? And frankly, is it worth it? Because private practice isn't for everybody. Let's have a look at those costs. Number one is consulting room costs. Now, I work in a private practice at an HCA hospital, two HCA hospital sites, in fact. And that cost me about £25 per hour. It's something like £20.83 plus VAT. And these hospitals are really well kitted out. So it's expensive, but there are other places in London that are more expensive. So, for example, if you're on Harley Street, the costs may be as low as £20, but they can go up to about £45 per hour. That's a lot of money when you consider that you have to pay regardless of whether or not a patient turns up. And some of them have add-on additional costs per year. So it could be that in Harley Street, it's going to cost you around £30 an hour, and then you'll probably get some kind of annual bill around about £400 a year. So you have to think about whether or not it's worth you working in that place. And when you're starting out in private practice, room costs is one of the big factors that people are put off by. So what happens is they end up booking little slithers of time here, there and everywhere to try and keep those costs down. You have to balance that against whether or not not being around much means you won't get found by people. So it's almost like there's a bit of a loss leader sometimes when you're starting out in private practice and the longer the hours you do and the more patients you see, the less those costs will bear upon you. Number two is medical administration. In other words, what does your medical secretary cost you? A big mistake people make is to try to do medical admin themselves when they're starting out. They think, right, I'm going to type this. I'm going to send off some dodgy looking invoice and uh, it's all a bit messy. Patients try and phone you up. You can't answer the phone. They can't book in with you, blah, blah, blah. So you have to have some kind of medical administration set up. Generally speaking, the days of hiring and waging a full time secretary are perhaps a little bit over. And most of the time now, people tend to use one of two models. They use the model of paying by the hourly rate. And then sometimes they'll use a sort of an annual fee basis, which is put together with a sort of slice of your income. And then there's the wage secretary sort of approach. So what does that look like cost wise? Well, if you're doing an ad hoc hourly basis, that can cost up to about £40 an hour sometimes. So the fewer hours you do, the more it tends to cost. It's a bit like a sliding scale. Once you get to a certain level of working, you might decide that you'd rather go for a sort of all-inclusive, like a sort of, um, like one of those holiday all-inclusive tickets where everything is, is done for you. So all the billing, all the, the, the transcription, all the answering the phones to patients. And that looks something along the lines of costs starting at the most economical, which might be 10% of your income, plus a sort of fee that might be around two or 300 pounds extra per month. So when you look at it in those terms, the more higher time you have, the cheaper it gets. But don't be put off by the hourly rate when you're first starting out. I do encourage you to think of the bigger long-term picture. So if you're working towards maybe working, say, half-time or even full-time in private practice, go in from the outset with one of those uh, sort of providers that can cover everything. Now, you might have an amazing medical secretary that you don't want to give up. And sometimes joining one of these structures means you don't get a choice about that. In that situation, you might want to hold on to your medical secretary and then put in some bolt-on costs on top of that. So that might mean outsourcing your billing or outsourcing your medical transcription to a company like WeType. That way, you get the best use of your secretary's time, who's fantastic at dealing with patients, and you can use some cheaper options to outsource some of those things that, frankly, he or she probably shouldn't be doing. Number three, medical billing. If you don't have an all-inclusive package, you need to outsource your billing. Please don't do this yourself. And it's actually a bad idea to get your medical secretary to do this for several reasons. Firstly, is that money and patient relationships don't tend to mix terribly well if you've got to ask a patient who's getting a bit grumpy for money. 
And the second thing is that it tends to get pushed to the bottom of the pile of the urgent things to do. So it's far more important that people be picking up the phones than wondering about chasing up that sort of slight little bit of invoicey stuff that was, you know, six months ago. So outsource your medical billing wherever possible. What does that look like cost-wise? Well, it probably starts off around 5% of your gross income. You need to think of it in those terms. Number four, IT and tech. Every clinician in private practice needs to be using proper medical practice software. So rather than fudging stuff together with documents and bits of tape, etc., you have to use some bespoke systems that have a sort of GDPR compliance wrapped around it, really good GDPR email, egress, all of that kind of stuff. And you need to update your tech. So what does that actually look like in terms of hardware costs and software costs each month? Well, things age, so you need to budget for getting new laptops, etc. over time. And I reckon it takes about £150 per month to do this properly. Number five, accountancy and bookkeeping. Be honest with yourself. Do you really enjoy dealing with tax and receipts? I don't. It fills me with terror. That's why I have a really amazing accountant. Now, you might be quite adept at actually dealing with your receipts and plugging them into a bit of software, and that's fine, but it will take you time. Time of your hourly rate versus someone else's hourly rate when you look at it is a bit daft sometimes, yeah? So why not consider giving your receipts to a bookkeeper who can rationalise them all, hand it over in a nice big lump to your accountant at the end of the year? Bookkeeping costs are something in the region of £25 to £30 pounds per hour, and depending on the level of accountancy and sort of complexity of your tax, your, your accountancy costs will vary. But if you figure somewhere between 100 to 200 pounds per month to take care of all of that stuff, you've got it covered. Number six, medical indemnity. Ouch! This is one of the biggest reasons why many doctors don't go into private practice. And I don't blame them, frankly. Back in 2017, the Medical Defence Union stopped covering spinal surgeons. They just said, sorry, it's too expensive. Bad luck. <laughs> which is a disaster for some people who are spinal surgeons and want to work in private practice. Medical indemnity costs vary hugely according to what your past performance has been like, the kinds of procedures you're carrying out, and also the level of risk of your individual patients. So for example, my own discipline, which is sport and exercise medicine, is considered to be one of the cheaper disciplines to indemnify. Some of my colleagues will pay about seven to 8,000 pounds per year, but because I work with professional athletes, my personal level of cover means that my indemnity is twice that per year. So it's really important that you shop around. And the other really important thing is to make sure that you're not undercovered. Generally speaking, a proportion of the calculation of the cost to do with uh, medical indemnity comes from your gross income. So if you're getting better and better in private practice, your income is going to be creeping up. And that means this year's cover may need to be more than last year's cover. So make sure that you don't under indemnify yourself. Number seven, courses, conferences and travel. Yep, you've got to pay for that too. <laughs> and if you want to be known in private practice, it's actually quite important to get out there and mingle with your peers. Last year, I spent £3,250 going on conferences, checking into hotels, etc. It was worth every penny, but you also have to budget for the time that you're away from clinic as well. Number eight, marketing your practice. I don't generally advocate that people jump on to the whole Google's ad thing and take out Facebook adverts, etc., until they know what's working in their practice. But you do need to think about software and tech, etc., etc., to enable you to do this. So, for example, MailChimp and ConvertKit each have a monthly cost for your email list. And you might also want to think about a bit of education to learn how to market your practice. So again, figure around £100 each month to be able to do this. So there we are. These are some of the costs that you need to think about shelling out for when you're running your private practice. There are others too. You're doing brilliantly if you can keep those costs under 30% of your gross income each year. But always remember, cheaper isn't necessarily better. I pay a little bit more for my medsec because she's amazing, so please don't steal her. I'm Dr. Cass Spencer-Smith of Private Practice Ninja. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time.